Hello, and welcome to a British Cartographic Society Tea Time Talk. My name is Christopher Eunice. I am the coordinator for the Tea Time Talks and will be today's chair. Today's speakers are Alex Kent and John Davies, and they will be taking us on a magical mystery tour of British cities, Soviet style. So without much further ado, I will hand it over to Alex and John, where they will give us what looks like is going to be a very interesting talk. Great. Okay, right. Let's get going then. Um, thanks very much, Chris, indeed, for your uh, introduction. And um, we're glad to be here. And we're glad to be here. And uh, I should say in, in our real form, because some of you might have noticed from watching the Mat Men video that we've been impersonated to a million people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> looking very different but no this is the real Alex Kent and the real John Davis so we're glad to be here we're glad to uh, give this talk to you and hopefully um, we'll tell you maybe some of the uh, the new things that we found out as we do this magical mystery tour of British cities um, Soviet style um, John and I as you know have been looking at these maps for well over a decade uh, our book The Red Atlas by Chicago University Press that came out five years ago um, goes into this subject in much more detail, obviously, than we can in the next 20, 25 minutes or so. So we'll give you um, really some snippets and overview. But what we're going to do is go through in sort of chronological order to some extent and a little tour around Britain. Um, and John and I are both going to say a few things about some of these maps. So hopefully we'll do that. And we'll give you some uh, scope to have some questions um, at the end. And we'll see how we get on. You may recognise already that that map that you see on the right-hand side there, the uh, extract is from London, from 1985, and you can already get a bit of an idea of, uh, of obviously what we're going to be talking about. But let's start off by just making the point that um, what we're looking at, of course, is only a little part of the Soviet military city plan project, that effectively this is a worldwide project. We know that around about... 2,000 cities were mapped in this level of detail around the world uh, during the Cold War, and these are military city plans, um, of which around about 100 are within the UK and Ireland. So towns and cities in the UK and Ireland, we've got this map on the left-hand side that shows you more or less the footprints that were covered by these Soviet military city plans, produced from 1950, right through to beyond the 1990s. We'll show you the latest one that we have today, um, which is a plan of Falmouth from 1997. So you've got that to look forward to, <laughs> or not, depending on, on whether that sends shivers down your spine, I suppose. And uh, then, of course, we'll, um, we'll go through and give you some ideas. So looking at these, uh, this arrangement that we've got then, 100 towns and cities at these different scales, there's only one map at one to 5,000. Most of these at one to 10,000 or the biggest cities at 1 to 25,000 produced during the Cold War. So we're looking straight after really World War II, but the earliest we know of is from 1950, most of them from the 1970s and 80s. And several of these maps quite nicely, or several of the cities have more than one edition. So places like Cambridge, Luton, Halifax, for example, sometimes the maps are decades apart, and that gives us a bit of an idea as to what we've actually uh, got to see in terms of how there's been changes in the urban setting, but also a little bit more in terms of the, the style and the cartographic style of the maps. So let's get cracking straight away and uh, I'll pass to John as we go through some of these. John will pick out some of the uh, the details that that will bring out some uh, interesting insights for you. We're going to start off with the map of Pembroke. This is uh, one of the earliest ones that we know of from 1950. When it was printed and you can see from the overall arrangement that actually the style of the maps has been set already by this particular time we've got for example a particular grid that has been set up alphanumeric grid for example there is no mention of the international map of the world at this stage but you'll notice that already we've got mapping of both the land so the topography and the sea, the hydrography, you'll notice that there's bathymetric contours. And of course, you'll see that the, um, the colours that we're using here for the, for the map and for the different various components, the urban areas and the hydrology and the vegetation, 
are really quite limited. So I'm only looking really at about four colours for this in terms of a, a printed map. Um, what I'm going to do is just zoom in a little bit and just to kind of make the point that I'm sure you already know um, that if we were to compare this plan of Pembroke with what the OS were producing at around that sort of time at a comparative scale, obviously <laughs> you'll know that some of the areas around the UK were completely censored by the Ordnance Survey, including this flying boat base at Pembroke Dock, but yet you can see on the Soviet plan that all of the buildings are shown and the interconnected railways are shown. On the OS map, you always know there's something fishy going on when there's a blank space, and here, of course, you don't see a lot of that detail at all. Um, John, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to pick yeah, up on. A couple of points I'll just point out here. Uh, note Barrack Hill on the on the OS map. We've got Barrack Hill. Notice on the Soviet plan a large uh, star-shaped citadel there. So not only is the flying boat base, but this ancient uh, ancient uh, castle thing is is missing from the uh, for the OS map. Mm. Notice also that has a, no, a red number fourteen. So this map has. Uh, Strategic objects, objects of particular interest, numbered and listed. We'll see the list of them later. But that number 14 is uh, a, a, an index number of an item of interest, which is that, uh, that citadel. But notice also just north of there, just north of where it says Pembroke Dock on the Soviet map, um, do you notice five, six and seven in uh, brown? The base colour of this map is brown, which later on they're all black, but in the early days it was brown. But there we have five, six and seven. Those are, appear to be parcel numbers or plot numbers, which again, the, the maps of the 1950s have them. Uh, we'll see as the, the styles change, that uh, numbering system disappears. And we've never been able to establish quite what that numbering system represents. Uh, because you don't find those numbers on British maps. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, and it's, yeah, go on, John. It's always worth um, remembering as well, of course, 1950s, this is before satellite uh, imagery, of course, so some of the sources for these could have been uh, German reconnaissance photographs, maybe captured from Berlin, that sort of thing. Again, a lot of this is open to uh, still investigation, trying to find out the sources for some of these uh, details. So that was, if you like, the first style of map that we ever have seen within the UK from the 19, uh, well, that one from 1950. The style did evolve, though, quite rapidly. And here is a map of Crewe. Um, those of you that are familiar with Crewe will know that it's an important transport hub. So you might be thinking the choice, the particular choice of cities does reflect something of the strategic interest to some extent. So as an important railway hub communications, it is actually very important crew. Um, so let's bear some of that in mind in terms of the choice of cities. But you also notice that, again, the colouring of the cities has changed a little bit by this stage. Um, again, we still have the alphanumeric grid. We have a list of uh, important objects in the top right of the sheet. We've got a street index as well. We've got lots of marginalia at the bottom that's telling us a little bit more about what the buildings mean and that sort of thing. But you might notice if you have a look at the sheet on the left and the detail on the right, that in terms of what cartographers would call the visual hierarchy, the industrial areas, industrial buildings certainly are shown very prominently. And it's almost as if they're printed in black, but actually it's blue overprinting the brown, so the dark browns, so that gives them this very dark appearance that sort of almost looks like black, and that then stands out quite a lot above everything else. So before anything, when you look at this map, you're probably attracted, your eyes get the attention straight away to those industrial areas. And that, again, is something that we see over time evolve into what is quite an important cartographic design um, in terms of the Soviet city plans, how to effectively show what's important uh, in a very prominent way. Um, again, we have those plot numbers that John mentioned earlier, the parcel numbers for the different sort of areas, perhaps useful for artillery targeting. Again, it's difficult to know exactly what they were for other than that, but you can understand perhaps looking again at this map that we've got immense detail in terms of streets, and of course, then in terms of contours, as well as a lot of the vegetation detail. I don't know, John, if there's anything you wanted to point out about well, this. Only, only that at this stage, they were copying Ordnance Survey maps. Notice that the, in the detail, we can see that the whole of the coloured area is hashured uh, with uh, diagonal lines. 
which is a symbol of, on their side that they don't actually know what the detail of the buildings is. Although they are showing the footprint of the buildings, uh, but they're, they're, they're saying we don't really know what's there. So they, they, this isn't taken from aerial imagery. This is taken from what they've discovered on, on OS maps. Mm. Yeah, okay. again, that, that yep. sort of tan gives you this kind of general idea of what the, the scope and extent of the urban area is, as with the vegetation as well. Uh, if we move forward a little bit to look at the plan of Kilmarnock, um, again, this is not one to 10,000 scale, but you'll also notice a few things that are maybe slightly different here. We've got, and these are elements of the marginalia, for example, we see at the top just under the title that says Plan of Kilmarnock, these references of N30, 15, 16, and that refers to the international map of the world, one to 100,000 scale. So in other words, if you were wanting to find out on the Soviet topographic map nomenclature system where this city was, you would know the square and you also know the one to a hundred thousand mm. sheets that would cover it, that would obviously give you more of a regional detail rather than the, the city itself. Also notice a little bit further down, if you have a look at that sort of middle image there, you've got um, the print code embedded within that margin. So that tells us, for example, the type of sheets, which is the Russian E uh, or I, the 17 would maybe be the job number and then the month which would be 7 July 58 the year and then K here the print factory for example you also see some dots showing again the, the colors of the printing although funny enough green isn't there but perhaps more importantly for us if you're thinking about the way these maps evolved you also notice something about the uh, the detail that's given for the source material there and you don't have to be too clever to work out given these funny numbers like 1 to 10 5 60 that here we're dealing with ordnance survey mapping that is non-metric so that would say compiled first line compiled in 1956 from maps of the scale 1 to 10 5 60 the os six inch maps of course and then there are some other map sources as well to give an idea of who uh, of what was actually the source material we've also below that got ideas about who the compiler and the editors were, for example, Kiburishkin, for example. And we would know maybe from that, looking at lots of other maps, perhaps those other maps that were compiled by those people. And then below that, we've got a Spravka, which is effectively a, a description. We'll, come, we'll talk about that later in terms of the Spravkas. We want to focus on the, the style for now, but that gives us a bit of an idea of some of this information that's quite compact and held in detail on the sheet. Remember, of course, this is all pre-digital, so everything had to be shown on the sheet and simultaneously. So given that, they have to hold an, uh, an enormous amount of information. And again, if we're looking at the next map here of Belfast, we can start to see some progress in terms of the number of colours that are shown and also then thinking about the type of information that's shown as well, how much information could be seen. So this is Belfast from 1964, again at the 1 to 10,000 scale. There's also a map of Tokyo, which is this style as well, uh, which we won't show you because we're not looking at Japan today. But funnily enough, again, similar style, similar way forward in terms of showing all of these uh, different features and particularly again, plot numbers and also the important buildings shown in a dark colour, dark brown, like, for example, the railway line here. Um, John, you want to say something about that um, extract there we've got from the, the centre and the uh, the detail in the bottom right? Yeah, so the detail in the bottom right reads that the plan is compiled in 1951 from the 1 to 7,920 plan 1947 edition and the 1 to 10,000 plan 1940 edition, reprinted in 1964, and then it's got the names of the compilers and the editor. So the one to seven, that's intriguing because that's very specific information. And the one to seven, nine, 20, that's an odd scale, but it's actually eight inches to the mile. And there was, there is an Ordnance Survey street plan of Belfast uh, of that scale, eight, eight inches to the mile, uh, dated 1947. So we know very specifically what, uh, what they've used there. The one to 10,000 is a little more intriguing because that's 1940. An Ordnance Survey didn't have uh, metric scales, but of course the Germans did. Uh, the Germans had captured six inch mapping. They'd converted it uh, 
photographically to metric scales. And almost certainly what's happened here is that the Russians have captured German mapping of Belfast. Uh, and that's what they've used in 1964. The compiler's names, uh, just as an incidental, there's two compilers there, Shish Shishkova and Rosina. They both end those two names and the editor's name as well, uh, Galikana, all end in the letter A, which indicates to us that these Russians are female. In other words, it's women who were doing these maps, both in this case, both the compilers and the editor. Uh, the women are often compilers of the maps, editors not quite so often, but um, that's, a, that's just an interesting aside on them. Mm. Alex. Yeah, great. I mean, it's, it's also interesting as well as we'll see as we go through the series of maps that actually the the human dimension, in a way, starts to fade away a little bit. So we don't tend to see those those names appear as often. Um, by the time we get to 1971, the early 70s, we start to see again another shift in the style, the kind of graphic style of these maps. And you, I don't know if you would guess where this place is. Uh, some of you in the north, I'm sure, will know the northeast. This is Blythe, Northumberland, uh, dominated by the huge power station there, again in um, a new way of showing the uh, the strategic objects by this time 1971 a new specification had been brought in where the color coding of these strategic objects was such that they could be readily identified on the plan and then they are listed and numbered so for example black features are military industrial green you can see the number nine there right in the middle perhaps they are military or communications facilities and purple, of which there are very few in Blythe, are governmental or administrative institutions. So there is beyond the, the mapping, of course, of the footprints of buildings and residential buildings and other buildings, there's actually an identification of strategic objects. And of course, with the expansion of different colors of printing, the capacity to show that information on the map. And that is again, really something quite important because it means that actually people can interpret the intelligence that's been gathered about the place a little bit more readily. So if we're thinking going forward, again, this is more of a chronological um, idea. And by the time we get to, for example, the map of Bedford, again, this is compiled in 1970 and uh, printed in 1971, we get an idea of Quite a sophisticated system in place so a grid system that is also linked to the international map of the world so that you can find for example by looking at the bottom right hand corner the coordinates the distance in meters away from a false origin and away from the equator if you needed to do that the fact you've got a rectangular grid gauss kruger projection standard for example anywhere in the world and again the international map of the world uh, one to a hundred thousand sheets that you can also notice as well. I don't know, John. Is there anything you want to say about this one? Only that this this style was established in so early nineteen seventies. We've got black base printing, not brown. We've got general staff uh, heading above the the city name, and we've got the addition date at the top of this page as well. And at the bottom of the page, this now becomes a standard for quite a long time. We've got a, comp a compiled date, but we don't have a lot of information about the source material. And we have a unit commander's name. Uh, we don't have all the, the compiler and the editor anymore. And that stays static for quite some time. We'll see eventually the unit commander's name also disappears. Mm -hmm. um, the only other thing I'd say about this yeah, and also, well, by now, we're always printed one side only. We saw the Pembroke one, it was printed both sides. Um, that By the 70s, there's none of that, and we've got a much more standardised format. Hmm. Okay, absolutely. And again, just thinking about the printing a little the, bit more. Yeah, just before we, well, just yeah. before we move yeah, on. Go on then. At that point, we're still just single sheets. Any city is just a single sheet. But the next year, by 72... Uh, both Bristol and Leeds have started to be multi-sheet plans, which are the first time that happens. Yes, it is, yeah, yeah. And again, just thinking about the printing here, we've got an expansion in terms of the number of printing plates and this is registration the first time we see being spot on. Uh, yeah, this is the first time we see the colour registration blocks appear, yeah. uh, is, is the late 70s, 78 in this case. 
10, ten colour prints. Ten colours, the, yeah. The colour registration blocks. And we can see that it's pretty accurate, the uh, registration. Given if you think about these factories uh, and the quality of this printing, the quality of control over both the paper and the printing matter, it's really phenomenally uh, impressive. Yeah, indeed. The quality of paper is very good as well. Obviously, you can't really appreciate that very much from a digital image, but feeling the quality of paper, again, astoundingly good. So we see this sort of increase and improvement in terms of printing, in terms of paper, in terms of the amount of information that can be shown. And it's worth remembering perhaps as well that from about 1963 onwards, of course, we had the the Zenit program of satellites that was launched. And so really from that period onwards and certainly into the 70s, increasing reliance on satellite imagery for uh, or as a source for mapping compared with earlier maps, for example, that were being compiled from looking at uh, existing mapping and, of course, other sources like trade directories and so on. So if we have a look here, again, thinking about printing a bit more, we've got Dunfermline from 1979 and Dewsbury 1983. You'll notice again the number of colours here. So not quite 10 this time. We've got nine. And on the Dewsbury map, there are nine spaces, if you like, but where some of those colours are not shown, not needed, like, for example, the, uh, the darker green for military purposes, those are obviously left out because they did not need to, to print that particular plate. But again, it shows you that idea of a consistent progress, if you like, in terms of the amount of information, the quality of registration, the quality of printing. Can we just go back to that one, Alex? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I'll just make a couple of point, an interesting point for the cartographers here. Look at the Dunfermline sheet in about halfway down. See the two closed contour circles. Uh, and oh, each, yeah. of, each of those has a little tick at each end. And so that's an intriguing convention. We can see with a closed contour, which is the high side and which is the low side. And the low side is the side with the little tick. And in both, in both of those uh, display that. So that's quite a useful convention. Um, and we see that throughout this mapping. Yeah, again, the, the expansion of symbology is something that uh, is also very, very important. We obviously not, not time to talk about all of that this time, mm. but how that, that symbology also expanded, again, is very, very important. And if you just notice there, there's a little uh, monument on the top of that hill, uh, that little yeah. sort of gravestone shape that you'll see. So again, wanting to show all of these different types of features in the landscape in a pure kind of topographic mapping way, whatever can be shown uh, reliably that is permanent and so on, permanent features particularly, put them on the map and uh, obviously identify them, make them easily recognisable. Here are a couple of other sheets we've got. So this is Plymouth, an extract here, 1981, and London from 1985. Instead of looking at the actual sheet uh, content, really, we're interested at this point in looking again at the marginalia and understanding what this can tell us. So we have the print code for Plymouth that tells us again that this is the job number of a particular sheet, the I series of maps printed in May 1981. And again, the, the places that they were printed, the print factory is Saratov, for example, in this case. But the information starts to get fairly thin in terms of the source material. So already in Plymouth, we've got here, it just says compiled 1970 for the London map. We have a little bit more detail that tells us it was compiled from the 1946 to 52 maps and 71 to 79 maps at 1 to 25,000. So we have a bit more detail, but not really a huge amount. I don't know, John, do you want to say anything more about those two? All I was going to say here was by now, by the, by the 80s, we've dropped the name of the unit commander as well. Yeah. So we don't, we don't see a name on the maps anymore. And it's quite rare also to see anything about the derivation data. The London one, we're showing it here, but it is exceptional. Usually the, the Plymouth one, which just says compiled in a date, uh, that's, that's all you normally get. Yeah. And that, that trend increases. It's something that we see less and less and less. So those of you that know and love Cornwall will, of course, know Falmouth. And this is the latest sheet that we know of um, that the, uh, well, by this time, the Russian Federation produced. So this is Falmouth 1997, which is when it was printed. But you'll notice that actually the styling of the map follows the same convention that we've been used to. So Prior to 97, Dundee is the latest sheet we know of, which is 1992. There are some a little bit earlier than that, uh, Bournemouth and Poole, for example, 1991. But 
1997, this is the last map that we know of. And rather interestingly as well, as well as the colours, for example, uh, you won't maybe be able to read it, but just under, again, the, uh, the print code on the right-hand side that you'll see, it'll say compiled, for example, from material in 1983, I think that is. But below that, you'll see actually there's a little copyright symbol this time. Uh, the Soviet Union didn't sign up to the Berne Convention about copyright. But by this time, the, <laughs> the military topographic directorate, which is responsible for producing these maps, uh, has added their copyright for this, which is quite interesting. So basically it says copyright BTU uh, 1997. But again, that same formula in terms of the number of colours, the colour coding, the Spravka, the list of features, for example, uh, and the street index to some extent, those are there, albeit because this is a fairly small map. It's 1 to 25,000 and only covers a small area. I don't know, John, do you want to say something about this one? Well, only, yeah, you've pointed out it's VTU now, not general staff. Mm. The general, the, the word secret doesn't appear here and general staff doesn't appear here. Mm. And instead we've got a copyright symbol. Yeah. But yeah, the very it's latest different. of the sheets that we know about is yeah. Vancouver of 2003, I think is the latest date we've ever encountered. Mm. But of the British ones, you're quite right, 97, which is of course after the breakup of the Soviet Union. That's what's interesting about that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, indeed, the Dundee sheet, of course, just after the breakup of the Soviet Union from uh, December 91, Dundee is 1992. Uh, again, maybe they, they had the, <laughs> the maps already there that needed to get printed out. But a lot of this, of course, suggests, certainly the family sheet, that this is a process that perhaps didn't stop with the end of the Cold War. So we're now going to look at the, uh, the Spravka a little bit and the object lists briefly to give you some observations on those, just thinking about the time. It's difficult for us to... Uh, to condense a lot of this without uh, <laughs> giving you a kaleidoscopic effect and uh, make you feel bad. So this is the reverse of the Pembroke sheet that I put up earlier from 1950. You'll notice here's the street index. And in the bottom right hand corner, there's a little note there that says Geographica Spravka, which basically means the geographical description. And this is the sort of information that this includes. So this is a translation. So it tells you where Pembroke is, Population 1940, interestingly, probably got from a German source, tells you what is important about the place. So the industry and the, uh, the port, for example, mentions Milford Haven. Interestingly, there is a plan of Milford Haven, but one to 5,000, the only one to 5,000 map of the UK we know. Um, maritime Arsenal, where that is located, of course, the significance of the port, state shipyard, some of the other industries, construction of cruisers, repair shipyard, factories, and so on. We'll talk about factories a little bit later on, and coastal fortifications and that sort of other things to do with hydro, aerodromes, and so on, barracks. But again, it's worth bearing in mind, this is a, a snapshot that really tells you what you need to know, but in non-cartographic form. So it gives you something of the, the military geography, the significance of the place. And if you imagine that that's from 1950, when a lot of this information would have been quite hard to find, certainly, by the time we get to 1985 and we see the Spravka for London, instead of this being printed on the sheet, it's included within a separate booklet that you can see on the right hand side here. And the Spravka is really quite extensive. So instead of a couple of paragraphs, we're looking at three and a half thousand words that tell us something about how important London is the various functions, and it includes, for example, <clears throat> details about the surroundings of the city, um, the, the industry, the infrastructure, about the motorways, how populated it is in terms of density, this sort of thing, and also mentions the Thames barrier. I don't know, John, do you want to say something about the Spravka in detail? Yeah, well, I was only going to say, it, it now has a very stylized fixed format. There's, se there's several sections. You can see top left general information, then you've got surroundings of the city, and then you've got city territory, industrial and transport objects, utility, communication, and medical institutions. So those five headings appear every time. And as I say, they've collected by now a vast amount of information. Almost all of it is uh, it's statistical, let's call it. It's factual and statistical, but it's also um, got quite some intriguing, what I call value judgments. And there's a little bit of a quotation I'm going to read from, uh, from the London Spravka, it's fascinating. And it says, 
West of the city is the most prosperous area of London, where the most cities, cultural institutions, publishing houses and major newspapers, as well as department stores, fashion hotels and restaurants are concentrated. From the northwest and the south of this, there are extensive parks, near which are located the mansions of the bourgeoisie. To the east of the city is an unfavourable, overpopulated area, almost devoid of greenery, of working quarters and docks. So that's telling them. And that quote, that's um, quoted from a report by Marx and Engels of their visit to London. So it's quite intriguing that the compilers in, the military compilers have included that bit of uh, descriptive text. The other thing to mention is that it's very obvious that this text has been created, the Spravka has been created quite separately from the map because the Spravka contains a description of the uh, Thames barrier, uh, which isn't on the map. Alex. Interesting, yeah. And I suppose, again, it's worth thinking about the Spravka and the, uh, the map as, as John says, being separate processes of production and how that might have uh, informed or not one another, which is quite interesting. If you think about the strategic objects beyond the Spravka, of course, and we've got this list that identifies and numbers the objects of importance that are on the sheets, well, Again, we see over time an expansion of these. So just like we saw with the Spravka from the 1950s and the 1990s, we see this expansion in terms of detail. We also see expansion in terms of the, the extent and coverage of those strategic objects. So if you have a look at the list on the left-hand side, Pembroke, for example, 1 to 10,000, you'll see some of the obvious industrial uh, objects there, for example, radio masts, communication centres, gas plants, sawmills, hospitals, that sort of thing. But then also we have to bear in mind that, again, this object list expanded over time and was shown on the map in terms of the colour coding of those objects. So we've got, for example, some non-strategic features that appear particularly really before the 1970s. So academies and schools, bakeries, even there's a bakery in Belfast that's mentioned. It might be a particularly good one. I don't know. I'll have to check that out next time if it's still there. I'll go there. Church and cathedral, these don't tend to be shown so much as strategic objects, but they were early on. Clubs, hotels, union workers, houses, for example, and theatres. So that definition of strategic objects tended to get a little sharper as the maps went on, but particularly after 19, well, really after 1971, when we had a new specification that then indicated that these strategic objects should be colour coded on the map and accordingly um, shown so that they could be numbered and listed and obviously categorised so that you knew what they were. So government administrative, military communications or military industrial. And again, in terms of the visual hierarchy, the density of those colours on the maps meant that they tended to stick out perhaps a little bit more than everything else. Um, numbers of strategic objects, John and Dave Watt have done some great work on this, thinking about analysing this. Well, that varies from very few places like Great Yarmouth, Gainsborough. Again, Gainsborough often comes up in what we talk about as a, a small place. Guildford to the biggest cities, of course, like Manchester, London and Birmingham, where you would expect perhaps they've got a greater number of those, uh, those special strategic objects. However, there is a focus on factories because of all of those strategic objects that are listed, in the British maps that we've looked at, or maps of the British Isles, we see that about 42% are identified, for example, as factories. So there is a propensity to identify factories, and not only that, to understand something about what they are and what they make. So there was a drive to try and find out not only whether an object was a factory or not, but actually what the product of that factory was and its name, if that could also be found and listed. So there was a real drive to get that information when it came to the industry of a, of a city. Some of the, the common mistakes um, that we see maybe with the objects lists, well, out of date information, so disused coal mines turning up, often they might be copied from older maps, particularly infrastructure tends to hang around for a little bit. Place names and certainly uh, feature names, functions like bank and court, or objects that are labelled bank and court, they tended to be interpreted as literally a bank or a court or a law court. So if you've got a residential area that's called bank or court, sometimes that has been interpreted or misinterpreted as, of course, meaning a bank or a court. There's a famous example, and I think Oxford of that. Um, there are also some other 
elements that list, uh, including on the object list, that don't appear on the map. So there are some other mistakes there. John, do you want to add anything to that? There's the list of the London. No, I'm, I'm, I'm very conscious of the time. Alex. Yes, me too. Yeah, that's good. We're coming right to the end. Yeah. So just to give you that's an idea, that's the first page of the London list on the right hand side that lists some 374 objects. So you can see plenty of stations and so on. So what I'll do is just hand over, John, for the last couple of minutes. There are three cartographic curiosities here, which I'll tell you a little bit about before we close. So over to you, John. This is Upper Hayford. In yeah, look, as it said, this is Upper Hayford in Oxfordshire, which was the US Air Force base from which bombers uh, went out every night over the Soviet Union and during the Cold War. Uh, what's intriguing is, of course, the OS map doesn't show the airfield. Uh, the Russian map does show the airfield. But the Russian map also shows, notice top left, a little arrow on the road. Now, on the OS map, that has a meaning. It means it's a steep hill. Uh, the Soviet map, that there's no meaning for that arrow. So it clearly is simply copied from the OS map, as are all the contour lines and the spot heights. So, yeah, they've taken everything they can from the... Uh, from the OS map. Oh, and including my lovely little tick on the, on the notice the contour line. And it's notice the contour line with the circuit around the 139. That's uh, dotted or dashed because it's, it doesn't, uh, it's not a 50 meter contour. It's, a, it's an extra number, isn't it? Because it's a, mm -hmm. a non metric map they've copied it from. Yeah. But, you know, the but then they've added, they've added all the, uh, the buildings and the, um, the runways from the airfield. Yeah. Uh, next one. Bradford. Next one's Bradford. Yeah, I, I like this one, not only because I'm from Bradford, but because look at the, the large name in the middle, Cold Place, appears twice on the map. Now, that's very, that, how that got past the editor, I have no idea. Clearly, what's happened here, they've had different street plans of Bradford. They've had uh, an street, a, a district name like that can appear in different parts of the map, obviously. There's a definite uh, definition of where it is. But the cold place has been copied on twice. But also, the main road running north-south there is labelled as Manchester Road, uh, and it isn't. As everybody knows, that's Huddersfield Road. Not, not Manchester Road. <laughs> but how the coal place got in, I have no idea. And uh, this is another lovely example. We always say that these maps are compiled by people and you get a cultural, uh, also looked kind of lost in translation a little bit. Uh, cultural difficulty of not quite understanding what's going on. So this is a, a little Pennine village. We're back in Yorkshire. We're back in the West Riding of Yorkshire, up in the Pennines. Uh, a tiny village called uh, up, uh, Sourwood Green. And in Sourwood Green is a mechanics institute, as shown on the OS map. And a mechanics institute was a, an establishment of Victorian times that give the working man somewhere uplifting to go in the evening, where there'd be lectures and a, um, a library and so on, interesting discussions, keep him out of the pub for the evening. But the Russians have seen mechanics institutes and quite reasonably, they've identified it as a really important place here. It's item number 23 is the Institute of Technology. Well, you know, close, but it is <laughs> but not quite. And so that's a lovely example of just the, the cultural difficulty of doing a map of somewhere simply based on uh, written materials uh, from, you know, and, and a culture that you know very little about. Yeah. Alex. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's that's very important to bear in mind that um, you know that that human element, of course, not only in terms of you know what we see as mistakes and so on of transcription and uh, looking at the the duplication of place names and whatever, but you have to remember, of course, that these are Soviet cartographers that are working thousands of miles away, looking at places that they have very likely never visited, of course, or really uh, never will and i'm just looking at the sources the imagery and so on to come up with what they have so it's amazing that they have come up with what they did do in the end it's a huge project but ultimately of course again these little glimpses that we get are quite wonderful because they show us and remind us that this was a human driven project so that's our talk i hope you enjoyed it um you know as usual there's always more to say about the maps mm. than we we always think we can but uh, just to say there's plenty more information for you to, if you want to have a look there are some in fact we've got all of the maps of the uk up uh, for you to look at
look at redatlasbook.com. You can see those. You can uh, look at the maps. You can order prints, reprints if you want to as well. It's free to have a look at them, of course. Um, and if you have any um, observations of your own, you want to get in touch, feel free to do that. If you send us an email at author at redoutlessbook.com, uh, they will come, emails will come to both of us and we'll handle your queries. We're always glad to hear because this is an ongoing project. And uh, of course, local knowledge is something which is absolutely crucial. So thanks very much indeed. There we are. Um, that's it, I think. Um, I think what we'll do now then is, uh, if that's all right with you, Chris and um, Jim is have a look at some of these questions and see if we can answer in the next few uh, few minutes. So let me just have a look. Um, thank, thank you, thank you very much for that, Alex. Yeah, and, yeah uh, okay, go for it, Chris. You, yes. Yeah, thank you very much. You've you've already you've already you've already you've already jumped to this to the next stage as as I can see. We've already got quite a few questions and uh, comments have already come in throughout the talk. So yeah. uh, as as I said, so we're into the Q and A session and. Uh, if anyone wants, if anyone wants to put any questions in or any comments, can you, either you can use the uh, chat at the that can be found at the very bottom of the page. So, if anyone's, so I think we'll let you continue. I'll let you continue on, Alex, because uh, you're yeah, in a okay. good. Start. We'll we'll see how we get um, on with these then. So, Ian Byrne, <laughs> good to see you, Ian. Uh, so, the convention for the tick and the downside of contours is using orienteering maps for depressions but not for hillocks. If there's no tick, we interpret it as a hill. Yes. And actually also on the Slovenian uh, topographic maps, you tend to get contours going, uh, sorry, the ticks going both directions to tell you which side the depression is, uh, which can be quite useful. So yeah, we'll, we'll take that as a comment. Thank you very much. Do you know where the bathymetry detail was sourced for the UK? Um, <laughs> we've got some ideas, simple answer no. We've had a look in comparison with a lot of Admiralty charts that generally tell us that it wasn't sourced from those. Soviet trawlers is one idea, of course, as is other. John, do you want to pick up on that a little bit? No, I mean, that's that's something that's intrigued us all along, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. It's, it's original research, a lot of it. We cannot relate it with the ordnance, with the um, yeah, uh, Admiralty charts. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. It's a great question, Mary, and absolutely no, right, no. because quite often no, with Ordnance no, it's Survey... very intriguing, very intriguing. Of course, everything, well, as usual with Ordnance Survey, everything stops at the coast, so uh, in terms yeah. of understanding bathymetry, you have to look somewhere else, but we've got plenty of stories about trawlers visiting ports, and obviously they might be mapping it. Right, OK. Uh, Ian Byrne again. London's population is 2.4 million inhabitants, Great London 6.7. So are only the inner London boroughs considered as London? Probably yes. Also, not trust the statement that's on the Thames, 90 kilometres from this confluence of the North Sea, given its title, that's not very helpful. Quite, yeah. Um, there are also these uh, these interesting points. And how population and some of these ideas of defining cities are, um, are approached, that's a The population is almost always taken from uh, UK censuses. Yeah. It's always a 71, you know, it's, yeah, it's, a, yeah. it's a date of a census. So they will have found documentation that, to that effect. Yeah, yeah the first strikes might, might be the old London County Council um, yeah. boroughs rather than by then, of course, the GLC had been up and running for yeah. nine years. Yeah, indeed. That is interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. OK, um, you may be better with this one. John, might union workers' houses have been a misunderstanding yeah, it's, of it's, former it's, poor law union workhouses? The thing that's that marked as union workers' houses is on a six-inch OS map with a very similar name. I've forgotten exactly what the name is, but yeah, it's something like that. Yeah, we, quite possibly. Daniel Brown, did Marks and Ensels visit London 100 years previously? Yes. Or is this detail likely included due to ideology? Yes. yes. <laughs> Seems about a date, but possibly still true. Possibly, yeah. <laughs> out, out of date, yeah. out of date is, is, is very much to the point. They collected a lot of data. A lot of it is... Um, it's asynchronous, we'll call it. It's, it's academic, it's old. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, right. I, Here's a good one. Uh, Andrew Ford, were all contours based on non metric OS sources, or were they updated as new OS metric sources became available? Well, for the city plans, um, generally, as the, the satellite mapping was more relied upon, you then started to have more reliance on the imagery to provide that information. So we have a radical remapping of 
contours rather than a copy. In terms of the topographic maps, John, I think well, um, what I would say to those this, were updated, weren't they? Wherever we found spot heights that, mm. on maps, on the Russian maps, they're almost always a translation or a conversion of a of a, a an imperial height on some on some age of ordnance survey maps and really a whole variety of different ordnance survey maps have been used even on one soviet map so it's a, it's a mystery in a way but they usually almost always relate to something you can find a spot height with that value you know in, on a, an imperial version of that value yeah, and it's also, that's that's great. It's also worth thinking about that idea that um, underneath all of this is this idea that they, they couldn't really trust, the Soviet cartographers couldn't really trust the mapping of capitalist regimes effectively. It was far better if you could create your own mapping and rely on that than rely on uh, capitalist or Western mapping. The, one of the reasons being, of course, that it's a very different approach to cartography within uh, the Soviet Union and, and with Russia, really, that if you're looking at a state produced map, this is a secret document. So if you are, as a Soviet cartographer, looking at maps that are freely available in other countries, the question would be, why on earth would you make your maps freely available that has all this valuable information? Surely you'd want to keep that secret. So there's a sense that there was an inbuilt falsification system going on with Ordnance Survey and, and other Western mapping, because how could you possibly make this accurate information available to the broader public? So it's a very different approach to uh, the construction and management of space when it comes and geography when it comes to uh, the Soviet Union, I think. So, OK, where do we go from next? Did you feel, this is Ian Evans, did you feel that some objects were identified to not destroy as well as military objects to attack? Well, I think it's uh, one we of the think, obvious we think things to maps, kind of, yeah, we one of the obvious traps that you feel like to fall style. into oh, go on. would be, sorry, John, you want to go on? I think you're talking. Well, okay, I was going to say, yeah. the, all the evidence is that these maps are not hostile in intent. Yeah, I was going to say they're, the they're, they're not targets at all. These are the maps you need if you're going to run the city. These show the, the civil installations, the infrastructure that you need to run the city. So, yeah, they are, in a sense, it's all not to destroy. It's all to capture and manage and operate. Yeah, I mean, the, the overriding, um, well, first of all, the first, the first thing maybe to say is the very tempting thing to do, the, the sort of Daily Mail um, uh, sort of feature that was on the book that we, we, we made was all about Russia's Soviet, you know, or Soviet Union plans to invade and so on. You know, the, the kind of idea that these are invasion plans. Well, really, we have to bear in mind that um, the idea behind these maps, as far as we can tell, is to gather as much information as possible. The point being that that information that uh, is knowledge, that knowledge is power that could be used for various things. So not as a single purpose objective for the maps, but actually as a multi-purpose. So really, it sort of takes the idea of topographic mapping of general purpose and multi-purpose and applies that to a uh, very detailed mapping of foreign cities. So not necessarily about which targets to save or destroy, but what was where, what can we know about it? And uh, obviously dealing with paper, there you have to put it all on, on once. So you have to therefore think about very cartographically how you're going to design that to work. So yeah, so not necessarily invasion maps, more of a multi-purpose, here's the information, use it as you, as you need and so on. Okay, I wonder how Salisbury Cathedral was described to inspire. Yeah, it would be good, Brian, wouldn't it, if we could get a city plan of Salisbury, because I bet you that in the Spravka, in the description there, there will be something about the spire of Salisbury Cathedral, uh, or, or Salisbury being a famous city, cathedral city with a big spire, something like that. I'm pretty certain that will be there. It'd be great if we could find it. It's not something we've got so far. It might emerge. That's the other interesting thing. The, the Soviet maps are always emerging all the time. How did the maps leak out of the USSR and were there any form of protest when they were? Well, Warren, that, um, that's a big question for uh, just very briefly, um, a few places, but generally the former, uh, or I should say map printing plants in the former Soviet Union, particularly in Latvia, one of those places where, for example, some of these maps were then discovered and made for sale. The first that we knew of them, um, is 1993, 
uh, where they were offered for sale by a Latvian publisher at the International Colour Graphic Conference in Cologne. That's the first time. And then after that, some other sources came up, but generally Latvia, uh, the Riga print factory, that was one of those um, places. Any formal protest when they were? Hard to say. Um, <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Eric, good to hear you and see you. Eric, great, from Germany on the German maps. In one to 100,000, one can find some more information used for military purposes, like street width, carrying load of bridges. This seems to be missing on maps of English cities. Is there a strategic bias between maps of the continent and the UK? My answer would be that um, not necessarily a strategic bias, but in terms of what data could you gather from the ground, that bias in terms of accessibility to information. If you compare a city plan of the UK with one in Germany, with one in a former Soviet Republic like um, Tallinn, somewhere like that in Estonia, there's a huge difference in the amount of information that you can uh, you could you could gather, you could access. So therefore, there's a lot more. I don't know, John, did you want to say any more about that? No, no. Car kind of, kind of, you're right, carry on. Yeah, it's not, not really uh, much of a strategic bias, Eric. I think, um, you know, there's always it, the question... It's what we could they, find out. If, yeah. if, if they could find the information, it would be on the map. Yeah. It's intended to be there. Yeah. And there's very few examples in the British cities uh, where there is detailed annotation. But, yeah, it would be there if they could have found it. Yeah, and I, I think that's also an interesting point, Eric, because... Um, as, as John is picking up on that, because actually it is the sporadic nature of some of these observations that tell you that it was probably uh, the information probably gathered on the ground. If it was something that was very easily done by mm. satellite um, imagery, stereoscopic satellite imagery, for example, which, which was available, then why was it not more systematic across the, the globe? But actually you see it's quite sporadic. So that kind of suggests that, um, again, it was about access. Okay, have you ever tried to find any Russian cartographers listed? <laughs> Good question, Jim. Yeah, um, there are some officers' records that have been published, and we have found uh, in histories of the, um, the military topographic director, we found some of these characters. Whether they're still alive or not today, it's really hard to tell. Obviously, it would be gold dust if we could find someone and um, talk about it, but given that these were secret maps being produced at the same time of hostile essentially hostile off for us, then um, it's highly likely that they're probably not going to come forward. We did do a talk in Moscow about this, John and I, in uh, 2011, and uh, we hoped that we would find people coming forward, but really we got virtually no one saying anything apart from where did you find the maps? So um, that kind of says it already. I think if Russians turned up in Britain and started asking people yeah. what they'd been doing during the war in terms of secret mapping, they wouldn't have been very forthcoming. So yeah. You're not going to get it. And of yeah. course, now the generation who did these are, you know, they're, they're, they're old, they're dying. So, yeah, yeah, sadly, the time's running yeah. out for us to, to get some uh, yeah. information from first hand accounts. That would be good, though. OK, um, did OS know that they were often the basis for Soviet map data? If so, were there any attempts by OS to put out mistakes in strategic places? Well, in 1997, I believe there was a um, a statement that OS put out to say that they believed that the OS mapping, particularly topographic mapping, not um, city plans, I'm not sure that was concluded, but the, the topographic mapping had been used, um, OS topographic mapping had been used as a basis for Soviet topographic maps, and therefore there was a almost a sort of an amnesty idea that people could send in the copies of maps that they uh, they were using, but also the idea that you'd be contravening o OS copyright if you're using these maps. So such was the, the strength of opinion at the time that, um, that these topographic maps, um, Soviet topographic maps were being used as the, uh, as the basis, or sorry, the OS maps were being used as the base for Soviet topographic maps. Um, were there attempts by OS to put out mistakes in key strategic places? Well, uh, I don't know about that. That's something you have to ask the OS, but certainly mm. the, the censoring of places on OS maps. We've just shown you the example from 1950 and 53 of the Pembroke Dock. The attempt to just wipe it off the map is one way of doing it. Clearly, it didn't really work if the Soviets have got the, the buildings of the interconnecting railway. So there we are. Foreign maps are less useful for Russians because they want names in Cyrillic script. So it's Ian Evans. Mm -hmm. uh, Russian troops, possibly, yeah. Given, bear in mind that um, 
really we're looking at unit commanders that are using these maps rather than um, rather than troops. Again, there's a hierarchy in terms of map use within the Soviet military. Uh, what's your hunt? Can I, can I just jump Sorry, in on John, that? go on. Well, I'll just jump in on that one because it's very yeah, interesting. It, yeah. across, across the Warsaw Pact, uh, the Poles who didn't use Cyrillic script uh, yeah. generated their own versions. The, the East Germans had their own versions. So yeah, the Cyrillic script was a problem. Um, and the Russians could use it, but the other countries who were using similar maps had to have their own versions. And we've got Polish maps, of course, in Britain, which we've shown before, uh, which have a Polish version of all the British names. So, yeah, yeah. it's just an interesting... Uh, no, thanks example. for that, John. Thanks. Sorry to, for galloping ahead there. I think that's a really good point. There is the famous Soviet... Uh, sorry, the famous... Polish map that's got the, the place names that are written phonetically, that's got, for example, Safend written S-A-U-F-E-N-D and Landen, which is L-A-N-D-E-N, and Hastings, which is something like H-E-J-I-S-T-Y-Z -E or something. So again, this idea of where some of those sounds came from, maybe cabbies or something like that has been mentioned. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> language, of course, was a bit of an issue. And of course, the Cyrillic meant that they could uh, read it. Okay, Jerry, then what's your hunch? Hello, Jerry, good to see. You. What's your hunch whether the Russians are still at it for the UK? Well, we've shown you a map of Falmouth 1997. There's a map of Vancouver we know of. Um, you know, what can we say? It's, uh, it's a global project. There's a huge um, legacy, Soviet legacy to, to move on. There are Soviet satellites that were very good, that some of those are still in operation. There's the BARS satellites that the, the Russians use. So I dare say it's a global mapping program, as it is for a lot of uh, NATO as well. So I dare say there's some mapping going on, <laughs> I think. Um, right, Gordon Johnston, good to see you, Gordon. At the start, you noticed some hydrographic data not on UK mapping. Do you think the near shore, coastal inshore area, are also the subject of strategic foreign mapping efforts? That's a very good question. Um, quite possibly. It's, again thinking I guess about what the um, what the strategic purpose could be for those but on the other hand there is very much a case in terms of what we've seen of Soviet mapping that if they could get the information they would put it on so mud flats cliffs uh, any there's a whole range of coastal information that is on the the Soviet maps in terms of symbology and so on so I think where they had that information again, the symbology was there to to put it on the, the plans and on the, the maps. I don't know, John, do you want to say? No, I that mean, you, you've summed it up. That's, that's, that's kind of it, yeah. Um, just to say as well, I know we're right at the... Right at the <laughs> it's fantastic to have these questions. They're really, really good. Um, just to say, there is the forthcoming um, special issue of the Carnographic Journal, which is issue four of, of 2021, still to come out, which should arrive fairly soon. And that is on special, uh, sorry, is on Soviet mapping and covers not only the military maps, but also uh, civilian maps as well. So that will contain some very new research uh, on a whole range of things, the Soviet plan of London, uh, the Soviet maps of um, British cities and so on, and uh, also Russian and Soviet tactical symbols, which is something we haven't looked at today. So there's a whole range of things there. A lot of those papers will become uh, available online ahead of a uh, going print, of course. But just to keep an eye out for that, BCS members, you will get that fairly soon, as soon as Tenor Francis have caught up, uh, obviously, with COVID. But yes, feel free, obviously, if you get any more questions, to get in touch. And uh, thanks very much indeed. That's been uh, really exciting for us. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you very much for joining us today. I want to thank Alex and John once again for what has been a genuinely interesting talk. We, we look forward to seeing you all in the future, uh, future talks. So for today, we want to say thank you and goodbye.